Lisa Mulavinaka, good afternoon and good Pella Avinun. A special welcome to our guest speakers, participants and viewers joining us on the Facebook Live on our Pacific Blue Line page. My name is Francis and I will be moderating uh, the first part of this Talanoa before I invite Joey Tao to co-moderate with me the Q&A session. Again, welcome to all our viewers tuning in this afternoon. I would like to acknowledge the Pacific Blue Collective who have been working tirelessly behind the scene to put this series of webinars together. The Pacific Island Association of NGOs, Piango, uh, Development Alternatives with Women for a New Era, Dawn, Tuvalu Climate Action Network, TUCAN, WWF Pacific, the Pacific Network on Globalization, PAN, and the Pacific Conference of Churches, PCC. Friends, today we take a dive into the experiences of deep sea mining in PNG. And we have a great um, lineup of speakers to draw and learn from. I think it is important, while we're still at the early stage of this Talanoa, to pose the, this question to begin our thinking process on what is there to learn from the infamous Solwarawan project for countries that are still persuaded to mine the seabed. Please allow me to share this brief history of PNG's engagement on DSM. Papua New Guinea granted the world's first deep sea commercial mining permit in 2011 to Nautilus Minerals Limited, a Canadian company formally listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange. With the experimental less plans of exploration, the Solwara One project was expected to commence the world's first deep sea mining project in 2018. That's right. It was going to be the first um, world's, um, world's first deep sea mining project. With investor interests in the Solowara One project, the PNG government was so enthusiastic that it opted to have a 30% stake in the project. It granted DSM license to Nautilus Incorporation under terrestrial land mining laws, but failed to consult the people. The Solowara One project struggled to maintain investor confidence and interest along with the PNG government. Now, communities from the Bismarck Seas were at the forefront of resistance against this new experimental form of seabed mining. The Solowara One project also came under fire from scientists, academics, parliamentarians, and churches in support of community concerns, calling for a ban on DSM in PNG's territorial waters. This call was widely supported across the Pacific with a petition presented at the 2012 Pacific Islands Forum Leaders Meeting. In 2019, the experimental Solowara One project sank with Nautilus Minerals announcing its bankruptcy leaving the PNG government at a loss of 153 million Australian dollars. I believe that should be a lesson to our Pacific governments. Now, this is the this is important, it is important to be aware that key investors and industry players from the bankrupt Nautilus company went on to form Deep Green Metals, another Canadian setup that acquired what was left of Nautilus Minerals in the Pacific. Friends, that is a brief history walk on PNG's engagement um, in, uh, on deep sea mining since 2011. This fight is not over yet. It has come back already in the region with a new name and a new face. On this panel this afternoon, we are joined by um, some of the key or frontliners and key advocates against deep sea mining in PNG. We have with us uh, Professor Chalapan Kalwin. Um, welcome, uh, Professor Chalapan. He is the acting dean for the School of Natural and uh, Physical Science and Professor of Environmental Science and Head of Environmental Sciences and Geography Discipline with the School of Natural and Physical Sciences at the University of Papua New Guinea. He is also the acting chairman of the PNG Department of Higher Education, Research, Science and Technology. Professor Chalapan is the team leader of the development of PNG Oceans Policy 2020 to 2030. Welcome Professor Chalapan. 
We also have with us His Eminence Cardinal Sir John Ribat. Um, Cardinal Ribat is a Papua New Guinean prelate of the Roman Catholic Church and a Cardinal since 2016. He has been Archbishop of Port Moresby since 2008. Cardinal Ribat professed as a member of the missionaries of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and has over the years served as a Paris priest, studied in Manila, and had served as Master of Novice for the missionaries in Suva, Fiji. Welcome, Cardinal Sir John Ribat. We also have with us Mr. Jonathan Mesulam. Jonathan is the founder and coordinator of the West Coast Development Foundation, a local PNG NGO, working with communities addressing issues relating to climate change and to promote conservation of their local environments. He works in his home province of New Ireland, advocating on deep sea mining, um, illegal logging and climate change. He has also been the spokesperson for the Alliance of Solar Warriors, an alliance of churches, environmental NGOs and local coastal communities around the Bismarck Sea. Uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Jonathan Mesulam. We have uh, Reverend Rame is the head um, bishop of the Evangelical, Evangelical Lutheran Church of PNG. He is also commissioner to the Constitutional and Law Reform Commission of PNG. Um, before taking up the role as bishop, he has a social. He was a social researcher and served as director of the Melanesian Institute in PNG. Uh, welcome again, uh, Reverend Dr. Jack Urame. Last and not uh, the least uh, is none other than Miss Christina Samokotoni. Christina is from uh, Manam Island, an active volcanic island in Medang province of PNG. Her island community currently faces challenges of being internally displaced uh, people, diaspora due to rising sea levels. She works in the community development sector with the local NGO Bismarck Ramo Group. Again, I want to um, welcome and thank our speakers who are joining us this afternoon uh, for this very interesting um, uh, webinar, Talano session, uh, from the experiences of uh, uh, PNG in this, in this conversation of deep sea mining. The, the proceeding will be as follows. Uh, to begin this Talano, we will pose questions to the speakers. They have five to seven minutes to respond as part of their opening remarks. Then we'll open up the floor for question and answers. We'll begin with uh, Jonathan Mesulam. Uh, uh, Jonathan, uh, you have been at the forefront of um, mobilizing your communities in the Bismarck area against Nautilus Minerals when it first started exploration. Can you please tell us more about this, uh, this work? How did you manage to mobilize communities? Uh, what were key areas that you need to focus on um, in order to convince communities uh, to be part of this bigger campaign? All right, uh, good afternoon all. Good afternoon, all. Good afternoon, Jonathan. Yeah. All right. Thank you for this uh, opportunity to present on the uh, campaign on seabed uh, uh, mining. Uh, firstly, let me thank the uh, organizers and the, uh, the uh, panelists who are listed yet for the uh, presentation. I. I represent the local communities, especially on the issue on seabed mining. Um, from the experience that we have uh, been through, I'll just share what we have uh, encountered and what we have done so far in the campaign against seabed uh, mining. Firstly, when the news on seabed uh, mining uh, was made public, you know, people in the community were not aware of this kind of project. So for us, it is uh, very important that uh, we share the, 
the information of the project, the bad, the good and the bad side of the project so that the community have a balanced uh, view of what this project is all about. So by working with the community since uh, 2011, after the license was grant granted, we find it a bit uh, difficult because there were so uh, many groups talking about this issue on seabed mining. So it takes time till we uh, were able to you know, uh, form the Alliance Network back in uh, 2016. So for me, I, I see that when we are divided, the, the, the voice of the people are not strong. So when the Alliance was formed back in 2016, led by the churches, the Pacific Council Conference of Churches and the PNG Council of Churches, that was the breakthrough, that, that was the drive that uh, when we said this uh, information back in the community, they, they, they see that the church is behind this uh, campaign, they see that a lot of uh, people that have been uh, vocal about uh, seabed mining are with, with the people now on the ground. So, um, the Alliance played a very big role in empowering local communities to know the, the bad side of this project because we, we are aware of the intention of the companies. They only give uh, uh, the good side of the project, but they don't really give the bad side. So as, as we, we were working with the community, the community tend to realize that the the benefits of this project is far, far too low than the destruction that it may potentially have on the their livelihood. You know, most of the local communities, we are coastal communities, we depend heavily, right, on fisheries. So, so by having this information, people tend to stand up. People tend to know that their livelihood is at risk. So uh, we have different roles to play. In the campaign, we see that, that there are different fields in the community. We have people in the community against uh, seabed mining. And then we have the provincial or regional campaign, national campaign and international campaign. So everyone played their role in the campaign against seabed mining. But most importantly is the very people back at the community. They have to be empowered. They have to stand up to say no to such project. Because whatever we do at the end of the day is the very people on the ground okay, that will uh, invite companies to operate. If they are with us, if they can say no to project, then multi-million companies will be uh, are sent away. Uh, we have experience of several multi-million companies that try to operate at the community level, but because of the resistance from the community, they were not, not able to operate. So seabed mining or Natalis project is one of them. We have the PMI jet in Medang and uh, others. Uh, that have resistance from the community. So the precautionary pre principle is very, very important. We, we do not know what will happen if this uh, project goes ahead. In the Pacific, the message to the Pacific, now currently we are affected by climate change. Coastal line, uh, island communities are affected. This seabed mining is another additional burden to the existing pressure that we have been feeling now from this impact of climate change. So as uh, Pacific community, we have to stand up. We have to support each other to say uh, no to seabed mining. So during our campaign, we, we also arrange for alternatives. What, if we say no to this project, what are the alternatives we have to offer to the community? Right? For example, uh, this month, July, we are staging the sack calling festival in uh, Kono. Uh, right. This is one of the alternatives we, we have provided for the community. It's a part of the ecotourism. So not only promoting ecotourism, but it is our cultural practice. This culture is being threatened by seabed mining. So now the people have to stand up. They, they have to use this as a means of protest against seabed mining to protect our cultural identity. And that is the Sakon. So I think for me, if we, have to, if we have to stop such project, it's all about solidarity. Everyone has to stand together one way and, and express this with, with our hearts. We, we have to fight with our hearts. It's not something that you, you just think of uh, doing for or to please people. No, you have to fight with, with from your heart. And that is very, very important. And for me, 
I'd, I'd like to thank the Pacific Council of Churches, the PNC Council of Churches, all the partners such as uh, BRG, CELCO, uh, uh, all the Alliance Network member community in Medang, Manus, New Island, Duke of York, uh, Millen Bay for standing up together to say no to uh, seabed mining. They've played a very important role in stopping this project. And the same experience we have, we want to maintain the community uh, okay. support and that is empower the community, give them enough information so that they can be able to make uh, informed decisions in any development. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, you've, you've stated some of the really key points of um, communities being part, being the key players, and when they are well informed, they'll be able to resist uh, these new developments or new uh, emerging um, developments that, are, that would um, impact the environment. Now, with that being uh, uh, the starting of our Talano, I'd like to pose the next question maybe to Professor Chalapan. Um, given the different uh, players, you know, that, that Jonathan had mentioned, the communities, um, the national, regional, and then the international, um, playing their different roles in, in, in standing in solidarity against this um, emerging issue, you've led um, a team on PNG's uh, oceans policy. What is your call on the government of PNG regarding deep sea mining? Or what would be your call um, to the government of PNG regarding deep sea mining? Professor Chalapan. Can you hear me? Vanessa. Yes, we can hear you, Professor. Okay. <clears throat> if you can hear me, let me continue. I think if you're asking me to at least speak for <clears throat> five or 10 minutes, should you wish to. Um, and let me go back to some of this work that we've been doing here in, in the country. Um, in relation to, it's good to see the church involved here, the, the colleagues around the Pacific Islands and so on, especially you're seeing, um, I, I, I call him the, the Cardinal of the Ocean. He's sitting here with us, um, Father uh, Cardinal Ribat, after sending him around the place to New York to make sure the campaign um, in relation to picking up a bit of science and taking it across to the world, especially with the UN Oceans Conference, and telling us about sending the same message that most people like Jonathan from New Island and everybody else in the Bismarck Sea would try and use this campaign. Um, one, of the, one of the issues that drove us to Papua New Guinea to develop our ocean policy is basically some of this issue here in relation to when we talk about deep sea mining, even though it's one of those that we don't understand very well. Um, we find that it's, it's a resource sitting in here, in, in Papua New Guinea, probably the biggest island, not probably the biggest island in, in, in the world. And it's an important part of how do you manage it. If you look at our land and you look at the ocean, the land, the ocean still has the biggest resource sitting in our country. When you compare Papua New Guinea to say Fiji or little islands like this, we still say the ocean is our biggest resource. When you look at all the other bits in relation to the warmest ocean in the world is sitting in the Bismarck Sea. And when you talk about, you know, resources like tuna, when you resource about this, these are the, some of the biggest resources sitting in the Pacific Ocean. When you look at climate change issue, and then when you come across here, you find that it's some of the exciting place here. So when you go to the, when you go to the government in around the world, what do you tell them? Do you want to protect 
the interest of our own people? My question here to a lot of our own people is, we ask the same question here is, who owns that ocean? Who owns that land and who owns that reef system? Have you actually asked the same question in Kiribati or Tuvalu, Cook Islands, Papua New Guinea? I think this is some of the issues that we've been going around the Bismarck Sea and uh, talking to our own people when you know outsiders come in. I know this company that you talk about the Canadian company that came out. Um, they were tossed out of Canada and they were trying to mine and look at uh, salmon and the government of Canada told them to go and do it somewhere else and leave the salmon alone. These are resource issues that belong to the people in Canada. So they decided to come to, you know, what we call vulnerable countries, small island states like in the Pacific. And they decided to, you know, deal with our own governance. When I mean my own governance is half the time because of our leadership in certain places like the, in our own governments, at the top, they don't know anything about the ocean. Some, some of them don't even understand what the science is, but they're interested in the dollar side. When you go to the bottom of this, the government issue, when you handle this is, have you asked, have you asked that old man and old woman in your country to say who owns that reef? Who owns the sea? We have started this work in Papua New Guinea because we, after doing this work in relation to, you know, visiting some of our friends in China, seeing what they have, bringing them down to look, look at, with the Japanese looking at some of the explorations in our part of the world. We think that we don't have the science behind it. We can't answer all that question because we don't have the technology. We don't have the capability, but we're happy to work around this. And a fair bit on, for the Papua New Guinea to come with its ocean policy, it's a bit like people like us. Scientists comes out, we've been in the ocean, we've been going from as far as Hawaii, all the way down this part of the world, going as far as India and so on, looking at this issue. And so when we come across, it's, it's small, but we haven't educated our own people. And they're trying to educate our own people is talking about basically, have you ever actually gone home and to ask your children, do you do who owns that ocean? Who owns the resources? See, the challenge between the governance issue I maintain it's I, I still containing is because these are people from outside who come in and they tell Pacific Islanders who tell people like our own governments and prime ministers to say, no, give me that and I'll do this. Have you ever thought of you developing it later? In your own time? Your resource is sitting there. Why don't you use the fish? We've got some of the biggest you know, resource sitting in here, like tuna, for example, like our biodiversity systems in, in our ocean, like the seagrass. Have you actually sown the seagrass with Chinese? Right across our own countries? These are resource sitting here, but we forget, or we have actually haven't gone down this line. This comes from what I mean by make reference to science tells you a little bit, but the governance of it tells you, go and start at home. Our ocean policy that we developed and we, we launched it in Port Mosby during the um, 2020 in here. It's, a, it's an important policy, but it talks about the science of it. Anytime you come in to do mining in this country, you make sure you do some work for the next 20 years. You, you prove it to us that it can work. And if you prove it to us that it works, then we, we agree. Our own people can benefit from it. This is what we call this compensation issue that our own people protect our prosperity, our education, our livelihood. But that policy talks about this and it talks about the various types about improving the governance of the coast of our ocean. That's one of our principles we brought in. We talked about integrating sustainable development in our own part of the, in our own part of the world, in our policy. And we talked about building capacity for Papua New Guinea to talk about sustainable development. And we talk about fostering alliance in terms of building healthy oceans in Papua New Guinea. We talked about high level, and these are some of the principles, high level ocean issues, the commitments, you know, that we talk about. One of the most important thing about, we call it the Papua New Guinea way. The Papua New Guinea way starts from where you come from, where your people come from. It's not talking to Americans or Canadians. Now it talks about making sure that 
you protect your resources. International law doesn't come from there. They start at home first. If you can know, understand your international, your backyard, you develop that law. Half of the time, most Pacific Islands, we go and borrow the international, the law of the sea. Where did the law of the sea come from? You should develop it back home first. You do your case study, you develop it, then you can go and tell, you know, the climate change guys like Paris Agreement and all the other law of the sea and everybody else that I was a special case. Most of the times we go with international partners or UN, you know, agencies and we say, we'll go with you, except you haven't protected your own backyard yet. And I think this is basically our ocean policy in, in our country in Papua New Guinea has learned some lessons from Cook Islands, manganese noodles. Other people came from Europe, trying to come to Fiji as well, do the same thing. Go to Kiribati and do the same thing. For us, it's the same, including Nauru. For us, it's the same like now. It's basically our ocean policy should try and protect our own people first. The resources, educate our, our leaders, making sure science plays an important part in education. And it becomes, you know, an ideal to protect our own people first. It's our little resources that we have. And instead of coming up, and so this deep sea mining, when they developed it in the Bismarck Sea, that's where we <clears throat> we haven't stopped lobbying around. We worked with people like Jonathan and our people in New Island, Madang, um, down to Millen Bay, because that's where it is as well. We know some of the fastest currents in the world are shifting in Millen Bay oceans, and by their exciting resources for energy. And so, I think that's at least I've given you some thoughts on. Um, the importance of why we developed this ocean policy for Papua New Guinea. But like I said, the most important, you'll find that our own people have actually started going across and mapping our ocean, making, mapping our own reef, mapping their own land to say this land belongs and we're trying to legislate it within our, within our government. So that's some of the exciting thing when I compare this with <clears throat> in Fiji, when you look at you know, your land, your ocean, your reef um, and Cook Islands and looking at all the other places as well. It's high time Pacific Islands get together and understand this um, this ocean. So for PNG, <clears throat> we're happy to, you know, come back and help our own people develop our ocean policy to protect our own people, and especially for the long term sustainability for our children. And so this is, I guess, I'll stop from here. But that's one of the most important thing is protecting the lives of our own people as part of our sustainability in this country. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Chalapan. Um, you've, you've, you've asked a lot of important questions, um, but you've also raised an important point there on knowing our own backyard. Um, we need to develop policies that protects our people um, before we engage um, in other um, level. Um, with that, I would like to um, ask the next question to Cardinal Sir John Ribat. Um, in your role, um, why is the, the why is the role of the church important in this work? Sorry, Cardinal John Ribet, you are on mute. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Okay. okay, thank you. Can you hear me now? Loud and clear. Thank you. Oh, okay, uh, before really going any further, first of all, I just would like to recognize the uh, the contribution and the support uh, for this great work by our international brothers and sisters countries. Yeah? I'd like to acknowledge uh, the Jesuits community in, in New York and, and also the Franciscan community in, uh, in also in, in New York uh, for their support to in this journey to try to uh, bring the concern not only within here, Papua New Guinea, but also out, out of our, our country, that this is not a matter only for us here, 
and are concerned and are worried, but also for those countries who are concerned, been hearing this and following this, and they, they are the ones who are supportive of this also. So the, the communities, the Franciscan, Franciscan communities, the Jesuit community in, 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 in America, in New York. Also, I like to also uh, acknowledge also the support of the, the, the Miseria community and those uh, were supportive also from Germany uh, in this case, and also for the church in Rome, they were very supportive uh, about this uh, uh, move. So they really helped to bring this out of Papua New Guinea to the international table. Yeah. So that was uh, very, very good. So I attended a lot of uh, 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 concern conferences about this uh, overseas and also the uh, World Ocean uh, Day in New York. So for that, I'd like to say thank you to all the communities and organizations that supports also and were behind us uh, coming forward with this very important uh, uh, concern that was uh, really kind of uh, in our doorsteps right here in Papua New Guinea. So thank you for that. Now, first of all, also I like I, I would like also to recognize the Pacific uh, Council of Churches, PNG Council of Churches, when we go together uh, to be able to start really talking about uh, this great concern. And uh, our first meeting was in, of course, other things were happening already. Had the uh, voices that were raised already against seabed mining uh, was already starting. And uh, then we were brought together in Fiji, 2016 when we all met there, all the leaders of churches and, and every, from Papua New Guinea also from the Pacific, we were all there. And at that time we was already our concern that, and we, 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 we issue this statement that there should, no, should not be, a, a, a seabed mining should not be accepted and should not be allowed in the Pacific. And that was our stand. That's what we wanted to, to, to continue to promote and continue to air that we have one, one voice starting from the Pacific right to us here to Papua New Guinea. And uh, that, that, that is what we were faithful to. I'd like also to thank uh, Professor Chalowin and also the, the, the scientific community to help, help us also know a little more about this uh, um, uh, seabed mining what it does to us and how it could uh, uh, affect us very badly. Also, on, on the other hand, when see, I come from an island also, from Water Island in, in Rabaul. And um, the thing is that when I went there for holidays, my people were telling me that, you know, we are afraid because when we, we surely go out fishing in the night and uh, these bright lights, these people were coming close to us. They have not told us how this will affect our fishing ground. So people already, you know, they, they, they were so concerned about their livelihood, about how they would live their life after this activity will go, will finish. And then they were asking, will the, the water, so water by it come up one kind, one time, all fish, now, all, all, all something, all same by me play, he enjoy him, all same me play, save, all stuff, me play go fishing, because me play save, by me play kissing fish. Me play go dive, but my black is more selfish now or something or same. So that is what they were concerned about. Simple people could raise their concern, but to who they asked me to be able to bring this out to voice this. And this would be representing only a small group of people, the island people, but that will be for the many islands that our people here brought, was, who stand, stood out to be able to raise their voices. They would not be heard. But through the church and through the, the the international community, bringing it out from here, they will be the one to be able to raise this concern. And my, my I, I really start, and I was so interested to come out uh, to 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 the, the the front with this uh, concern. It was really because I was hearing the government was not prepared to do any study to make us aware of what is the the positive impact and what will be the negative impact. There was nothing of this kind. Therefore, I started asking questions. Hey, this is really very serious. 
uh, and how it will affect our fishing industries here. There was no, nothing. And as Professor Chalvin was saying, the concern here was on the dollar sign. That was the concern about the side effect. About what will affect us? That was not a concern. It was only the money. Will it really help our, our people who are in those areas where this project is conducted? Until now, there's nothing happening there for the poor people. And their, the, the, their resort to be able to continue to live is the sea. And that's where I took this very seriously. And I was speaking because I wanted their voice to be heard and to be represented well. So that's what I, I was hearing. And also about that, there was no policy governing the ocean. There were policy governing the, the, the mining on land, but on the sea, where is that? We never had it in, uh, before. There was, so there was nil, no policy to guard the life in the sea, nothing. And the important thing is that on land, we are there to make sure that what There are people there to be able to guide and, and supervise. In the sea, who will do on the, the, the equipment right here in Papua New Guinea? If it betrayed us, and there will not time to be able to, to repair that, nothing. And that's where the, the problem was. So when I saw that, I said, no, I should come out and really kind of say something. And I was happy that also our one solo uh, uh, voices came up, the Bismarck, they came up. And they were so supportive. And uh, we were all united about this. And so we saw that we have to be this voice to be able to make sure that our, the voice of our uh, people at home who, who have no voice at all, that they will be heard, their cry will be heard, and that we, we attend, we will listen to them. And their cry really, when I went to these places uh, overseas, they were heard, and I was so interested, I was so grateful that I went to New York and we had that conference and I was speaking there and giving uh, the, the concerns and also what, 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 what was not done as a preparation for this to happen. So in New York, when we had this, this conference and I was speaking, they asked me, where is this the Nautilus? Where is this company from? I said, it is from here, from somewhere here in the, uh, and I said, Canada. And then they, 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 they asked, what, what, uh, what is the name of the company? And I said, Nautilus. Straight away, they called them at that time. And they asked, why are you doing this to PNG? And then they, they said, oh, I, they were asking me to go and see them, but uh, I was not uh, responding. That was not the point. The thing is, if you really want to do something here, come and see me. If I come to look for you, I would not know. But also I must say this, when we were still here in PNG and uh, one of the uh, uh, officers from Nautilus, a local guy, he invited all the church leaders. We went for, for, for that meeting, briefing, and he was telling us that, oh, Nautilus is ready. Is ready to be able to to start. First of all, where 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 was this done before? Was it when when it came to be experimented here? When you said that this will be experimented here in Papua New Guinea, where wh was there any experiment done before this? And he was saying yes, it was done already before, and it was aware. He didn't know where it was, but we are told that it was done. But really, the problem was. He, I mean, he enjoyed already what he has to, to get from them. And they were, he was kind of remunerated to speak for the company, not for the people. That's when I saw this and I said, no, this is not right. And also with well, no preparation from the government and from, uh, to tell us exactly what, this, what will happen, there was nothing. 
and and with that there was no policy also. So we were kind of asking him, and he was kind of uh, telling us that it's done already. We should not worry, and uh, we we had to allow this to happen. So for th th this was not a kind of right for us. Right. And I saw that, and really, it was really not very a good way of approaching this. The concern was from what they were getting, what's what they, they were enjoying, but for our people, our our poor people, and also. For the environment, there was no concern for this, nothing. And therefore, coming out like this, I think it was really a way of uh, making our people aware that that we are not ready for this, we are not satisfied, and we are kind of worried for our environment, the livelihood of our people. And as my people were saying, will the ocean be the same as before, as we were enjoying? Will it be there for us, all the lives and all, all that in the sea? Will it be there still for us? You know, simple people were already kind of worrying for their own livelihood like that. Mm. And so for that, uh, I'm really grateful that this, this uh, conference uh, organized mm. by Pacific Council of Churches and the community there, I'm grateful that this has come out. And also with the voices from that time when we met in Fiji, the voices came out very strong. And I think we should really support this. One lastly, one meeting we had here in Mosby when we were called together, and that is when we heard that uh, Nautilus was uh, was winding down. But then we were still warned that this is not yet the end. While Nautilus is uh, winding down, the license to mine is still alive. It's not expired. And therefore, we were, our concern was Will this be sold to another? We have to be vigilant. We have to continue the fight because it's not over yet. That's right. Thank you very Thank much, you Kadir. for the concern of raising this important uh, uh, point. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Cardinal John Ribat. Um, your closing is, uh, I think, what we need to be very vigilant uh, about. Uh, the, um, the names have changed, uh, maybe the face, but they are coming with the same motive. Eh? Um, with that, um, I'd like to pose the next question to Christina Samoka. BRG has been one of the national NGOs in PNG that has continued to raise awareness uh, against extractives. What has been the key message to convince communities or um, the method of awareness that BRG has used to meet the people halfway and accompany uh, them through this journey? <laughs> Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I'd like to join the, before I could answer your question, Francis, if you don't mind, I'd like to join the uh, rest of the, the panel uh, panelists before me and give a word of thank you to those that have actually started this journey of um, opposing the detrimental uh, experiment of seabed mining in PNG and also in the Pacific. Um, those, those that have actually gone before us and who are not in the circle anymore, who have passed on to another sphere, we'd like to acknowledge them and say thank you for because of their work and because of the hard work that they've done and for raising and standing up and being the voices um, um, to speak against a lot of things that were uh, what we would call progressive right now um, at that time to stand up and be that voice and to, to show us um, how to walk with our people and on our land. So I'd like to acknowledge those that have gone before us and also those that are still here too. We want to say thank you to everyone who's been on this journey and who continue, continue to be on this journey. Thank you to the Pacific Blue Line uh, Committee and the community that has put together this um, conference. Um, I'd like to say uh, thank you for this opportunity to be able to share the experiences that we had in uh, PNG when uh, we were faced with the monster uh, of experimental seabed mining in our waters, in our, in our shores, in our doorstep. Thank you for that. Um, Francis, if I can uh, recall your question, uh, you asked uh, what is the approach that the organization, uh, Bismarck Ramadou, who works with communities, what, do we, what kind of approach do we employ to continue to um, support communities who 
I speak against the, or participate in the discussions of extractive, the extractive industry in PNG especially. Um, I guess one of the big, greatest um, and most important approach that we take is the, the art and the skill of listening. I guess that's one of the biggest things that's missing in a lot of um, the conversations that's happening right now and in all sectors, in, in all forms and in all levels, I guess, is the art and the act of um, the, the skill of really listening and truly listening to what it is that somebody is saying about and is sharing from within. Um, seabed, the, the, in the case of experimental seabed, <coughs> seabed mining in PNG and now in the Pacific, I would say it's, um, it's, it's an accumulation of not taking the time to actually listen to what it is that somebody actually wants to see and how they feel about a certain issue or anything in their life. Um, with regards to um, seabed mining, seabed mining is, is a, a symptom. Huh? You could say a symptom of what has been, what has been going wrong in, our, in the leadership and in the, in, especially in the leadership, the governing leadership in our country. Um, we were, when our, when, when our constitution was put together, we had uh, the leaders then, the constitutional planning committee, they went all around the country and they listened to what it is the people wanted in terms of forming a nation, a new country. What it is that Papua New Guineans who came from, who were working in their gardens, who came from the river, who came from the sea, who came from the mountains, what did they see would, um, would be the best way of governance and governing a new country? What would be the best way of uh, managing resources? After listening to all of those people and going around the world and listening to what different countries were experiencing when it came to um, development paths that they chose for their countries in terms of nation -hood. and listening to the pros and cons of those and coming back and sitting down and actually um, analyzing all of those and listening, not from just their head, but from their heart also, and learning and, and leaning on the wisdom of, of our culture and the, and, the, and the places that we come from. Um, I guess that helped to form, I believe, one of the greatest constitution we have in the world. Um, and the great thing about the constitution, the PNG constitution is, that one of the, the five principles that, that guides it talks about um, integral um, human development. It talks about listening to what people actually want and, and always falling back on the wisdom of where we come from. Because each individual that comes from a certain place who have lived in that place for generation and generation have accumulated wisdom on how to live in harmony with that place and with that environment. And therefore wisdom of governance has also come. Um, and that has guided the, the development of our constitution. And I guess the organization, Bismarck Ramo Group, what we do is um, one of the things that we've realized as an organization is we've lost the art of listening as a people. And that is the greatest thing that makes up Melanesia, makes, makes up Papua New Guinea is that we, get, we take time to sit down and listen and really pay attention to what is being said. And we've lost that up. And I guess that the organization, um, its foundation is based on really going down and taking the time to listen to what people want, have to say, whatever it is that they have to say. And, and learning from that and taking that and, and sharing that with those that have the time to listen and also share the same concern. So uh, one of the biggest, uh, I guess, challenges that we've recognized as an organization is that with the, with the great constitution that we have over time, I guess in the last say 10 to 15 years, we've actually lost the, our way We've actually lost our way in keeping true to the true essence of who we are as a people. And with that, as we, as 
we continue to lose our way, we continue to open doors for, um, the, we say, I guess we say we open doors for distraction to come in. And one of the things that we recognize as an organization is, as you go further down or as you go further into the communities who are we still hold on to that art of listening and art of really taking time to listen and to when you as you go into the communities you recognize that that art is still there and the wisdom from which that art brings is still there and they maintain it but as you go into communities that have or areas in the country that have actually left that that art of listening and learning from the wisdom the wisdom of that art they have actually um, open doors for distractions that come in to destroy the, the quality of life that we live. So seabed mining is one example of that happening to our people. So at, at this Macromo group, we try as much as possible to, to go down and, and, and listen, and listen with all that we have and to hear what it is that people are saying. And one of the greatest things that they kept saying over and over again, when they heard that seabed mining was going to be, was given the okay by our political leaders, is that this is not in line with any of the wisdom that we, that we have. This is not in line with any of the uh, wisdom that has guided us for generations. And it is for sure going to come and destroy our lives. And over and over in every community that you go to, that's what they kept saying. And that's what we kept saying over and over to our leaders that this is not in line with any of the wisdom that we've come in. And certainly this is unconstitutional because it, it does not even come close to what the, our constitution states. And as um, Professor Halloween and um, Cardinal John Ribat has rightly mentioned, that it was not even captured in any of our Mm. So, seabed mining really, like any other extractive in the country, I guess the biggest thing that we've lost as a nation in Papua New Guinea is the art of listening to our people and listening to their concern and what it is that they want. Um, it's become a trend, I guess, in the country that people, we, we seem to think that those in positions of authority and who have the decision-making power, think that our people in the communities do not know anything. And because they don't have access to the latest technology or the latest information, do not have anything of value to add to the discussions around development in the country and in the region. But they do, we all do. And it is until and unless we take the time to listen we will be able to see that there's a better path that we can we can develop for all of us. Um, one of the one of the I guess misconceptions that um, throughout the ex experience of seabed mining that we've had was um, oh people in the communities um, are against development. No one is against development. It's that insensitive senseless distraction that we are against. And I think that's what people, we need to, and until and unless we take the time to listen, we would get to understand why people are saying no to what is being offered. So I'd like to um, end by saying, um, I'm really happy that we get to share this experience and I'd be more than happy um, to share more experience with uh, participants and those that who, are, who are here too. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Christina Samoka, for those inputs, the art and skill of listening. We're in a fast world that we do not have the time to listen, eh? um, but to listen from our hearts as well. Um, for this um, um, last question, maybe to end the first part of our, our session, um, Talanoa session today, um, Reverend Dr. Jack Urame, the Evangelical Lutheran Church has been vocal against the issue of seabed mining in PNG. The church has a firm position for a ban on deep sea mining. How has the church progressed its position against deep sea mining? Thank you. 
Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, I would like to express my uh, deep gratitude uh, to the organizers of this uh, conference, uh, as well as my appreciation to uh, the speakers before me. Uh, we learn a lot and we share a lot uh, because this is our story. Uh, this is our issue. This is our challenge. And so thank, thank you for joining us, the Pacific brothers and sisters, and starting with the story uh, from Papua New Guinea uh, with this uh, uh, very big challenge. Uh, we are very concerned. And so I am very pleased to say uh, a little bit about what we are doing as, as church on the ground. Firstly, I must say that I think there was very little awareness, there was very little information, and actually the people uh, were not really clear what was happening. Uh, the decision was made at the political level. And so a lot of people were caught by surprise, and even the churches, uh, we were not you know, part of the initial discussion uh, we didn't even contribute much uh, to the government uh, to make actually informed decision uh, on the project. And so actually, uh, you can already see uh, in the beginning, uh, it was a political push uh, without involving the people, without including the communities and without even uh, including the churches. And that for me was already, you know, the greatest mistake uh, because um, it concerns all of us together because uh, the impact of such a great development will affect all of us uh, because uh, we live in uh, one ocean and, and, and so we are surrounded and, and so we live together as a, as a community in the, in the region. Uh, so therefore, uh, the churches uh, collectively, uh, including the Lutheran church and, and all the mainline churches were against the idea. Uh, two years ago, we met in Port Moresby, uh, seven mainline churches came together and we shared our concern and then we were discussing on the whole issue. Uh, even maybe uh, Natulus is not able to probably, uh, you know, uh, uh, develop uh, the, the mind, uh, you know, uh, as we heard, uh, the new phase is coming again. And, and so there is still a great threat uh, to our people, uh, to the region. And, and therefore, uh, when we met as church leaders, uh, we clearly made our position very clear. We said, uh, we are totally against deep sea mining. Uh, because in view of the potential uh, danger and destruction it will cause and our people's livelihood will be affected uh, and, and so there will be you know a complete disaster and we said Papua New Guinea should not be you know uh, come or should not become a field uh, for you know experiment uh, if we want to create history and to be the first uh, to allow such development to take place, uh, it is going to be, you know, you know uh, uh, really uh, challenging because people will be affected. And therefore, we said as churches, uh, we are against this idea. And so our voice was, you know, taken to the government. And up to now, we have never received any feedback from the government. Uh, what is the decision of the government? As church, we will continue to raise this voice because we believe that we have the prophetic voice and we have this uh, prophetic role um, to be the voice of the people in the public. And therefore, um, we will continue to maintain our position and will go against uh, the entire concept. And also, if any future development is going to take place, uh, on the seabed, we will be totally against this. Uh, quite recently, there was also another project uh, proposed uh, and the waste from the mine will be dumped into the sea. And so we were in the front line and we said, uh, it is not about money, it is not about mining, but it is about uh, the lives of the people. It is about their well-being. Uh, it is about our survival uh, because these things will affect us. 
And so money should not become the important concern. And, and so we should not push development that will have negative consequences on the people and will affect the livelihood of the people and will also destroy the entire ecological system. Because we believe as church and as society, we believe that the sea, the sea is part of us. The sea you know, is connected with our history, connected with our story. Uh, connected with who we are as you know Pacific Island you know nation, and so uh, we have to continue to embrace because uh, there is also one section in the Papua New Guinea Constitution that says um, um, our cultural heritage is part of our strength, the source of our strength, and this source must also be passed down, and that is not really clearly captured in that decision, current decision uh, to uh, mine under sea. Because, as I said, this sea tells a story. Uh, sea, sea has, you know, uh, a lot of things to tell because uh, we are connected to the sea, and so we cannot continue to support any uh, development that will have negative consequences on the people. I think there is enough mining taking place in Papua New Guinea, uh, and then therefore, uh, mining, any money that is proposed to uh, take place under sea uh, is totally out of our agenda. And so we will go against this. Uh, the voice is very, um, very strong because uh, even though we may not have the you know, political influence, we will continue to raise our voice and we will continue to go against. Back in 2017, um, the Lutheran Church uh, joined part of the global community of Lutherans, and and we, uh, you know, uh, came back from our convention in Windhoek in um, uh, in uh, uh, Namibia uh, with this message: uh, creation not for sale. And we believe that God gave us the mandate to care for the creation. God gave us the responsibility to become good stewards of creation. And the sea and anything that is under sea is part of God's creation. And so we should take this as an important responsibility that we have this to uh, care and to protect because it is for us, for this present generation, but also for the future generation. If we make decisions at the political level, such as this one or any other decisions without considering the future will totally harm the future generation because we have this responsibility to create a future. So our decisions today must be in considerate with the coming generation because uh, if we don't, it will have serious impact, not only for us today, but also for the generation coming after us. And so the churches continue with the message, you know, uh, of um, care and protection of environment, but also uh, speaking against uh, the whole idea of this extractive industry because we are already facing a lot of huge challenges in the country and in the region. And so what is not good and what is not, you know, contributing towards the uh, welfare and, and also towards the well-being of the society cannot be accepted, you know, um, as development. Uh, so on the ground level, uh, we are also doing a lot where I think with me, I have uh, Warren Maguti, uh, who is also engaging our youth, you know, in many, many different ways and raising the voice and telling the people. So community engagement is very important. So I will allow a little bit of time to uh, Warima to maybe share a few things, what actually is organizing with the youth groups and with the communities and doing something that, you know, is very important and trying to empower the communities to take ownership and also to take responsibility. Uh, Warima, please. Thank you, Bishop. If I may, I'll be short. Uh, thank you. I think most of what has to be said, the Bishop has already mentioned. But working mostly with the young people, I'll just raise that emphasis on that or uh, more on that. Uh, young people are very more um, vulnerable in terms of when talking about all this in general. Seabed mining is an issue. We are more focused on other issues, but the bigger picture of the corporate greed and exploiting their future. And when I work more with young people, I see that they're more, um, they're more have been shaped by the kind of the education system that their perception about what it is, it's different from what we try to, as churches, bring it with the message of God, and not only talking about the issue, but connecting them to the Bibles and all this, it's a, it creates an impact. And we have seen that from experience in the working on the deep sea. 
uh, seabed mining, uh, sorry, not the seabed mining, the deep sea tailing uh, um, campaign against the Wafi Gulpu mine. Uh, so I just want to point out that I don't, uh, most of what uh, we do as a church is something but focusing on the young people is, uh, is something. And in Morobe, this is something that we have been uh, uh, working on. Uh, and yeah, I think I can stop from there. Yes, uh, maybe last sentence from me. Uh, we are seeing uh, a new trend where our uh, qualitative values, uh, you know, are, are quantified and everything is labeled with price tags, you know, uh, even including mountains and our, our rivers and, and our sea and even under the sea. Uh, so uh, whose agenda are we pushing? Uh, if we are turning our qualitative values that, you know, uh, con, you know, strengthen the, you know, the relational aspect of our life in the Pacific. Uh, it is now being quantified with, with, with price tags and numbers, you know. Uh, that for me, uh, we uh, have, to, have to understand and we have to come up with a collective, you know, uh, you know, collective uh, understanding and decision that you know, our way of life as Pacific Islanders, our way of life as Pacific people, you know, is based on our relationship, is based on the environment, is based on the rich network of a connectedness to every aspect that, you know, contributes to our well-being. Uh, that is as far as what I can say. Uh, my last words, thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Dr. Jack Urame. Um, you stated uh, some of very uh, key points um, that creation is not for sale. Um, and we are seeing um, I think all, all around the region, we're seeing price tags being put on our ecological, um, our environment, yeah? uh, which we need to be aware of. We're now going into the second um, part of our um, um, Talanoa session. I would like to invite uh, Joey Tao um, on this session. It's our Q&A. Um, if we already have uh, some questions posted um, from our from our from participants or viewers viewing in this afternoon. Um, can we have those questions? But uh, Joey Tao. Uh, thank you, Francis. If you've just joined us on Facebook Live, you, uh, you're joining this conversation on the Pacific Blue Line. Uh, we're listening to the experiences in Papua New Guinea. Thank you to our panelists who have taken us through a journey highlighting uh, the importance of how the struggles that mobilize communities at the forefront against this fight, the important role of our churches uh, nationally, regionally, and internationally, um, and the importance to ensure that science and policy are informed nationally and are homegrown. And lastly, the importance of uh, national principles or mama law that informs uh, people or we as a specific people in this case as Papua New Guineans. I'll open it up now for questions and uh, questions. So our panelists, if you have a question you'd like to pose, please do, do so by raising your hand and you'd be allowed to ask. I see a, or if you have a comment, please drop it in the uh, comment box. Elis Hafa, I see you and we'd like to make this more interactive. Would you like to ask your question, please? Uh, thank you, Joey, and thank you to um, all the, the panelists. Um, I was just wondering if there's any process in PNG for uh, demanding due diligence by the government when it comes to companies uh, engaging in extractive activities. Thank you. Uh, due diligence and process. Professor Chalapan, if we still have you uh, on the panel, would you like to answer that question or anyone on the panel would like to respond to Alice? Unmute me. Can you hear me? Loud and clear, Professor. Okay. There is a process where you talk about due diligence. We have policies within the country about when, uh, when you come across a number of this kind of work like this, especially like any project, like whether it's in the deep sea or on the land, anywhere, we have a due diligence that's been, it's part of the country's policy. 
for <clears throat> for this Nautilus and for this uh, deep sea mining, including a couple that you've actually mentioned about, you know, Wafi Gold and so on, we, along the coast. Um, there is a process that goes along that line. So number one is communities need to be aware of it. They need to stake, stake it out. And then there's from the community, what I mean, community is land, landowners should be part and partial of it. So there's a process involved. And then there is the provincial government who's supposed to be involved as part of the, you know, Tourism. Then it comes to the government in relation to this, it could be minerals and resources authority, mining guys as well to be involved. If it's anything to do with say LNG, they will have to get involved with it. That's it. as well. Those are the kind of process that it goes across there. If you need somebody from outside to come and support in relation to provide another view, that's the kind of thing the provincial governments, including you know, national government can ask for due diligence as well. That it's an important part of the process that needs to be coming. All process in relation to any big projects, they call the environment um, impact uh, statements. It has to be done. How big, how small, but there's a different size. So there's certain policies in here that the country need to do. With this, in relation to deep sea mining, we don't have a policy as a country or in the Pacific. We're the guinea pigs of the world. So that's where it means it comes where all the environment impacts the statement, statement and they were developed, all of these are developed on land. In the ocean, this is the exciting bit about how do you develop your policy for this? When you ask due diligence, this is the kind of thing that basically go back and start at home. And hopefully we correct all of this issue here, like for this one, the deep sea mining. Or if, even so, you know, that's way down there, around about close to 2000 meters down below the ocean. Some of the mining aspect of it, throwing their rubbish into the ocean in let's say Wafi Gol or down in Madang or crossing Misima and some of those places, including Octedi. These are the things that we will have to look into it a little bit more critically because they impact, like they cause the, some of the biggest disasters in the ocean. So I hope that allows you, but there's a lot of work to be done there. We have an ocean, a draft ocean policy, a draft offshore. They call it a draft offshore policy, but it hasn't been completed. It's still on the pipeline. So it's some of the things that people like yourself in churches and also to put pressure on our own provincial governments, our own people to push it a little better, but that's something we have a long way to go yet. Thank you, Professor Chalapan. And you know, you highlighted a really important point about not having uh, legislation or policy work around such projects as this subject, deep sea mining, the absence of um, such projects, also noting not only national and regional, but there is an absence or the countries are currently working towards a mining code within the ISA. So internationally to this, um, a lack of guidance around policies uh, that would inform deep sea mining in the international waters. Um, if you have any questions, please do drop it in the chat box. Maybe just, I was hoping Jonathan was still on, but unfortunately we have lost him. But Christina, you've been working with communities. BRG has been working with communities. One of the um, issues that Jonathan highlighted is that how Nautilus in its early stages of exploration had an impact on some of the cultural practices uh, noting the shark calling festival and other traditional practices of the Bismarck Sea. Would you mind sharing with us a little more on how the early stages of Nautilus exploration has had an impact on the cultural practices or the coastal communities in Bismarck? Thank you, Joey. Would you mind um, asking that question, the last bit of your question again? It got jumbled up. You've been working very and hard. I guess it's working. because of my network. Sorry, Bismarck Ramo Group has been working closely with community organizations and grassroots uh, groups. Uh, one of the things that Jonathan highlighted is how the early stages of exploration in the Bismarck Sea has had an impact on some of their cultural practices, notably the Shark Calling Festival, one that has, you know, has 
have pointed out as having uh, an impact on the early stages of exploration. Would you like share, to share more? Okay, so the shark calling festival had an impact on the, um, the early stages of the exploration. Is that what the question is? Yes, at the early stages of exploration, we had reports of, uh, you know, the community uh, having reports that their traditional practices of shark calling, uh, the early exploration of uh, northern the project, yeah, had an impact on that. Okay, yes, thank you. Um, yes, uh, when we when we work when we did a consultation with the community. The, Back in 2015, um, communities along the west coast of New Island, um, including Jonathan, brought up the uh, fact that even before um, the seabed mining license was made known, that it was made known, that it was issued, um, there were communities saw um, ships and and you know lights in the in their waters, the vicinity of their traditional hunting grounds, their you know, fishing grounds, um, and and most thing is the exploration and sea was disturbing the 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 shark calling area because most of the sharks, as you or some may know, um, that the communities in West Coast New Island, uh, some of the communities in West Coast New Island have a culture of a shark calling um, and most of where they they say the shark comes from is from um, close to where the exploration license was given and the special money lease was given so in the early stages of the exploration along that uh, around that site um, already, um, noticed uh, plumes of you know, dust and um, under the sea night. So even before people knew that there was such a thing as seabed mining or that um, there was um, exploration licenses given or even special mining was given for the seabed experiment of seabed mining to be done in PNG, communities were already experiencing the effect of it in the, um, in the seas, in their uh, traditional fishing grounds and their shark um, calling grounds. Um, also to add, um, parts of the areas that where they were proposed would be under the special mining lease and would be in the um, exploration licenses were part of their sacred um, sites. So sacred roots, sacred roots where um, communities have a belief that uh, the, they're dead. The, the certain times of the year, their calendar, that part of the area. So those were some of the concerns that came up during the, uh, the consultation. I hope I answered your question, Julie. Yeah, thank, <clears throat> thank you very much, Christina. Uh, we have a question and it's a panelist to panelist. Uh, Reverend Doctor, would you like to ask your question to uh, Professor Chalapan in regards to the ocean policy? Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, in reference to what I think was already mentioned by uh, Professor uh, Chalapan, uh, in PNG we have uh, landowners, uh, you know, they identify by our, you know, laws, uh, the, the PNG laws, but does the new ocean policy also, you know, uh, give way for locals to claim legal ownership to, to the sea? Uh, I, I don't know uh, if there is any. Um, are you there? Yes, Professor Chalapan, loud and clear. Okay, thanks, uh, Dr. Jack. And I think these are some of the issues that, uh, you know, a number of you raising um, from the, like I said, from the technical side of what's happening and from people like yourselves, you are with the communities and our own landowners and our governments. And a lot of this is not coming well and it's not evolving a lot of you in relation to understanding our resource issue. 
So when you were talking about, does it involve land owners? <clears throat> Let me give you this uh, um, model that we're doing. After the ocean policy, it's actually getting our own, um, what do you call the governance issues in place. We're trying to look at, in terms of working with DJEC, that's the Department of Justice, they have an ocean secretary up there now. We will try and push as much as possible, but we're looking at the governance structure, um, especially working with claims. So in the policy, it's actually allowing landowners and claims to work in, in the ocean, their reef, and any little island from Milling Bay all the way up to, say, Manus and so on, Gulf and so on. So this is to help our own people understand that the ocean policy is there, but it has to be implemented from a bottom up upstairs. So if you take it back, that policy gives you a framework that we have allowed it, but the organic law within our, you know, within our government allows us to start going to deal with how do you take it on? That within the provincial and clan and you know, the districts, LLGs and so on to work on this. But the most important is we're trying to say, if your clan owns some of the reef, your island, and so on, you can map it out. We've already started the process in CRC, in Manus, in certain places, New Island. We've actually started to pushing our own people, including down to Kerama and those places as well, um, trying to help them um, map their own boundaries where they come from, where they own that land or own that sea. And so this process is slowly moving. And hopefully people like yourself from the church and communities, when you see this, it actually embrace that ocean policy to support our own people. And hopefully other Pacific Islands can take, you know, the complexities of, you know, Papua New Guinea traditional system here and learn from it. <clears throat> but that's our challenge. Uh, okay. Thank you, Professor Chalapat. I see a comment from Benji Pato. Would you like to ask your question live? Okay. All right. Yep. Benji? Sorry, my apologies. Um, it's the I'd like to take the, the opportunity to thank all the panelists um, this afternoon um, with an insightful uh, narrative of what's currently happening in, uh, in, in PNG. My question is actually in relation to, because um, from, from what I've been hearing, um, I just wanted to ask, how has youth, women, and marginalized groups movement engagement been like in advocating and combating against uh, deep sea mining. Um, and my second question is, has um, indigenous knowledge and practices assisted in the work that you're all currently doing? Or does that mean that it needs to be sort of implemented to assist with the current work and the progress um, in, in terms of advo advocating against um, deep sea mining and legislation reform? Benaka. Thank you very much, Benji. Maybe I'll ask uh, His Eminence to uh, respond to that. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. The, the, the question is about um, getting our people to be really participating and be part of this. The, this is really an important question because uh, our people, they, they need to be informed well. And their participation will really bring meaning to their own lives also. And that, that is something that, that we, are, we, we had to continue to work on. Um, in, in the earlier piece, when we really kind of uh, start working, working on this one, we were going together and we were working together as a team. Uh, now, since uh, we uh, kind of uh, here, we heard that uh, Nautilus was winding down. Uh, that's when we were kind of uh, not coming together much, but there were activities that were going on to be able to try to get our people uh, be prepared for it. But now at this time, I think it's really when we are hearing that that is a, a new uh, development that is coming to be able to get um, this project going uh, under a different name. 
I think that this is what people need to hear. We have to get them so that uh, this fight or this voice against uh, this must continue. And we had to get the government also to realize that uh, this is about our nation. This is about the future of Papua New Guinea. When we mishandle it at this time, our people will suffer. The environment will be really get out of it. You see what happened now, what has happened before with uh, um, in, uh, in, in Western province, when they have that, that mine, uh, and also the, the, the waste that was dumped into the river, that destroyed the river, lives and so on, and it went to the, the, it went to the sea. So our people were aware of that. And of course, to, to a certain extent, they've been, they've been helped to kind of uh, um, benefit from that. Th those who were living a lot along the river. Uh, and I think it was kind of uh, when, when BSP, uh, sorry, BP, BP company that were responsible to, for that big mining in Octedi. Uh, I think to a certain extent, the people themselves benefit, but also to be able to get them realized that uh, they have to uh, continue to be the voice, to be, to be aware of, of this. And of course, okay, uh, the company at that time was uh, uh, taken into account and through court cases and so on. Now they, they compensated the people there. And of course, part of that were kind of put in a way that it will be, was made known or was made available for our people also for the whole of Papua New Guinea through project and so on that was there. But, uh, as you, the, the question comes, that how are we working together to really kind of get our people to realize the importance of the danger that this is bringing to our livelihood? At, at the, to the, our, our people back in the villages, to a certain extent they have, but they have to, we have to continue to remind them. We have to continue to give them the knowledge, uh, scientific knowledge that will help them to be able to um, be truly united and speak against this, when, they, when people are, are kind of meeting them, confronting them. Because there are people here, I realize, there are people who support the government, and there are people who really for the people. So we have these two, two groups like this are working here. And we have seen that working in, uh, in, in the past years. But at this time, everything is kind of uh, gone very quiet. But I think with this one now, it's important uh, that uh, since a new, the, the company we still operate and they are still moving forward. And I, I, I have, uh, the license is still very much alive. The, our people must be prepared well at this time. And mm -hmm. thank you for the question because that's what we, we need to kind of be aware of that we had to continue to get our people prepared. And uh, so that when, when the time comes, we're able to speak one voice that will unite us uh, to be able to see that this project, such project like this, does not go ahead. And it is really because those people who will be affected very much are those people in the rural areas who, because uh, that's their livelihood. And the thing, as I said one time, that you know, our people here, we, don't, we do not have uh, insurance, nothing. Our only insurance is that, the ocean and all that. And when that, that is destroyed, we are poor. At this time, we can still say that we are able to live and we are able to, to, uh, to enjoy life. When there is a disaster or whatever, we know where we go and get our food. And that's why it's important that way. So I'm, I'm grateful for the question asked and that will kind of, that has put us on a way also to try to, to, to kind of uh, uh, bring us together and unite all the, 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 the voices that are there to be able to speak from KVN and from Medeng, and uh, I think also from Rabal, we, we need to come together yeah. to start working together again. And, and also to speaking to our members and through the, the advice of uh, technical people like uh, Professor Kalawin, they, they've been so supportive and helping, helpful to us. And also the international community, as I've mentioned, they've been so helpful to us to be able to make sure that this uh, such uh, 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 preparation like this and understanding reaches us and we are able to get our people also to be united with us thank for this very, effort. Thank you very uh, much, Carl. And thank, thank you for you. using the chat or the
the church as a space, a platform that bridges our people at the grassroots level or at the forefront uh, to policymakers or those in power or those that make decisions um, and the role of the church. Thank you very much, Cardinal. We'll move on to uh, an, uh, an anonymous question. Um, asking the panel, what is the strategic advice for other Pacific uh, countries on um, deep sea mining campaigns uh, in the Pacific? What would your advice be uh, for other Pacific island countries, given Papua New Guinea has gone through this experience? Then we can come back to Christina who has raised her hand, but I'll just post that maybe to um, Dr. Jack Urame, if he could respond to that question. Uh, thank you. Uh, from my uh, experience, uh, I was struggling to, you know, uh, do some kind of political lobby to convince the political leaders to listen to the people. And so uh, my advice is, you know, as, you know, uh, Pacific Islanders, uh, how can we as civil society and churches uh, join and together to convince uh, the uh, governments of the nations, of the island nations, uh, to listen to the voices of the people and the churches to make informed decisions? Uh, the question is, how credible is our voice as civil society and as church? Uh, how can we convince them to make informed decisions uh, based on you know, our experience, based on our wisdom and based on our advice? Uh, this I think is the most uh, challenging part. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Reverend Dr. Urame. Uh, Christina, you had your hand up and I will allow uh, for one more question uh, after Christina, but Christina, you had your hand up. Would you uh, like to share further? Yes, thank you. I was going to support uh, Cardinal Ribat on his response to Benjamin Patel's question. Um, has indigenous knowledge and practices been used and assisted in the advocacy work against seabed mining and ocean protection? Um, I think the best way to answer this is it was because of traditional indigenous knowledge and practices that has actually pushed communities to stand up and advocate against the idea of seabed mining. It was because of the protection of that, because communities continue to um, uh, practice um, the, the indigenous knowledge and practices. They were the ones who actually stood up and said, we have to say something about this. So. The, the whole campaign on seabed mining in PNG was largely led by community voices, indigenous knowledge and practices that guided and supported the, the campaign on seabed mining in PNG and it got away. And it still is the biggest uh, contributing factor to ensuring that community voices are, are maintained in um, discussions of uh, development. Right now, as um, I guess doc Dr. Urame's question uh, rightly puts it, how do we ensure that uh, voices are, communities' voices are heard in um, discussions or negotiations of development pathways in PNG? And I guess because our constitution allows for indigenous knowledge to be um, valued in these discussions, Right now, as we speak, and the reason why we have the issue of experimental seabed mining and extractive industries in the country is because even though we have systems and structures in place, they are not implementing what needs to be implemented. And that's creating spaces for creating vital, important spaces that will have um, indigenous knowledge and practices uh, in the discussions of uh, development and the different development pathways. That's the reason why we have the um, problems that we have today with issues of extractive industry. So I just wanted to um, answer Benjamin's question by saying it is because of indigenous knowledge and practices that the issue of seabed mining came to surface in PNG. And it's because of that that we continue to um, hold um, our people and our, uh, our authorities in check because all of us are Papua New Guineans at the end of the day. So um, as Melanesians, as Pacific people, hold on to your roots. Thank you. 
Thank you, Christina, for reminding us about our culture as a form of resistance to such developments. I'll take this last question um, and maybe just post it to the panel who would like to go first answering this question, but it's asking how do we ensure the diverse voices of our people in Papua New Guinea, communities in Papua New Guinea, and we could extend that also to our communities in the Pacific on how the mining code can be developed at the ISA level. Any takers from our panel? How do we include the diverse voices, not only in Papua New Guinea, but throughout the Pacific uh, in informing the mining code at the ISA? Anyone from our panel would like to respond and before, uh, Professor Chalapan? Okay, thank you. Um, Jan, you still alive or you still sleeping? <laughs> well and alive, we'd like to hear from you. Okay, good. Let me give you some of my, you know, global experience why these are some of the kind of challenges that people like us and technical, um, you know, knowledgeable Papua New Guineans who come back and we're sitting in institution, research institutions right across the Pacific and then helping our own people. A lot starts with who you are. When you go across the same, we, the Pacific Island became the guinea pig. Papua New Guinea became the guinea pig of if you've been to countries like England, South Africa, India, they were all trying to do the same thing, including Canada. They chose to come to Papua New Guinea, these business-minded people. They realized that this. So when you talk about the kind of resources we have, it's about the resource issue. It's about that ocean. But when you talk about the identity, how do you get together and work around this area? And I tell you that the biggest ocean in the world is still sitting in the Pacific. If you can get this and you can model what you're learning from Papua New Guinea and what you can pick up what we're trying to do here, where communities, most of our communities don't understand this because it's a business approach. People came from outside to come and do this. It's a governance approach. When they came to this region, they landed in Papua New Guinea because they think that Papua New Guineans don't have knowledgeable people around or knowledgeable institutions. And this is where they came through from the back door. So if you understand the governance and understand this, how do you get this? Within the culture of this country, more than 800 different languages and cultures, we're still struggling. How do you get one together to keep this kind of um, working together to find when new ideas like this? Ocean is still, un, and I call it, I think last time I, talk to the churches around and I said, how many planets are there in the world? I put that question to all of you. And the same thing is, what do you know in the ocean? It's still unknown. We're still trying to un understand what it is. But it, within our own culture, within our own bread, it's our bread and butter. How do you protect this? And so this is where I'm coming up from it. If we can do this in Papua New Guinea, the most complex society in the Pacific, and then we take the forum leaders and we take it to our leaders and across. Here's one of those. That's why I'm saying Papua New Guinea has done its ocean policy. We've gone through a process. We've seen the, you know, down in the forum trying to develop its own policy as well with some of the countries not implementing this. But if we can hand, handle this a little better, work together as a team, especially in looking at that resource issue, the ocean is the biggest ocean resource. From the surface, from the air, all the way down below, we need to do something about it. We need to protect it, but it's our backyard. So that's where I was coming across. How do we get our own people from church group, the landowners, the claim? It's a governance issue. That's why I look at people like yourself. You're doing a great job, and this is a thing. Because this mining doesn't start from Papua New Guinea. It's actually started in Cook Islands, the manganese nodules. But we were slow in doing this and the EU guys were trying to push us. So if you go back in the history, it started somewhere else, but we're slowly trying to pick up the pieces here. And for Papua New Guinea, the writing was on the wall, except we didn't get our act together. And that's what I mean. With what you're all doing, what we're all doing here, I think it's a great move. If we can get together and continue to do this and push our ocean policy right across to all our 
going to all our provinces, all our islands, and so on, and support it, I think that's where we'll go somewhere. And it's still the biggest challenging resource. Remember I told you, you've got only seven, you've only got 10% of the land compared to the ocean. 90% for Papua New Guinea in the ocean is still the biggest resource. So how do you protect your ocean resources for the communities in our own country? If I haven't answered your question, but that's some of the challenges I want to see how we work together in relation to getting our leaders. And but it must start from the bottom. It must start from your people, our clan, our provincial government to come up with this and then other Pacific Islands can you know, learn the lessons. If you're going to Nauru, I think that's something we can influence Nauru as well. Thank you very much, Professor Chalapan. I think that's a really important point you highlighted about uh, informing national policies or guidelines that are homegrown, uh, community informed, grassroots informed, before we could look elsewhere. And that could be spoken for the rest of our, our region. Unfortunately, time has caught up with us and that brings me to uh, a last question to our panelists very quickly, just one minute, what's next? Maybe we can start with Christina. What's next for PNG on the issue of deep sea mining? Thank you. Um, I'd like to begin by saying I want to support Dr. Uh, Professor Chalapan's uh, message by saying we have to start from our back door. And a very important question of how do we ensure our voices are, are captured in the ISP laws that uh, currently being put together. What I would like to answer that with another question, and that question is, how many of our countries, the Pacific Island nations, have the people from ISA have actually come down and had a, a comprehensive meet, um, consultation with the countries that they propose to have this um, um, experimental seabed mining in? How many of these countries has that happened? It certainly did not happen in PNG, yet ISA continues to write these laws. So I'm asking our other Pacific Island nation countries who are thinking of doing this, how have your leaders um, ensured that you are part of the discussions that's happening? Why is a law being written about what's going to happen in your country in another in, in Jamaica? If that's where I say, if my, my memory serves me right, if that's where it is. Why is it being written in Jamaica and you have no um, voice in it? The consultation should be happening at your doorstep where the effects will be happening. So stand up and ask for that space, stand up and demand for that space. I'd like to support and I'd I'm, I'm grateful that Professor Chalapan says it starts at your back door. So ensure that the consultation for mining laws at ISA level be done at your doorstep also. Um, what, for what's next, Joey, um, I think Jonathan Mesulam and I have just spoken recently, and I'm glad that um, Cardinal Ribat has brought up the um, uh, consent too, that we need to get together. We've already talked about um, meeting up and talking about not just the issue of seabed mining, but um, healthy oceans in PNG and other issues, especially issues such as um, the deep sea tailings uh, placement that is happening in the worst possible um, way of managing waste from land-based mines that are dumped directly into the sea. It's one of the discussions that yeah, could actually this. pick up on also. Yes, the next step for us in PNG is continue our discussion on healthy oceans. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. Uh, uh, Your Eminence, if you could just yes. very quickly, what's next? I know Christina highlighted a few partnerships uh, yet to happen, but very quickly in one minute, if you can. Okay, thank you. Uh, that what next now? This time, uh, we will we will be the PNG Council of Churches will be meeting together and calling all even well the PNG Council of Churches will call the meeting. And then we will invite all the voices, all our uh, partners, talking about the importance of uh, where do we move from here with the new, now for me it's new that I'm hearing that uh, there's, the, 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 this, there's a new company that is coming up. Now that is for sure, we have to prepare well for that. In the beginning, we were only kind of uh, coming together by hearing that. 
and we were kind of, uh, oh, I mean, from our own, like uh, Christina has said, from our own doorsteps, from where we were, we were kind of seeing things like this happening. And then we were, how can we, we be the voice here? And that's when we come together. But this time, since we have the bodies are there set already, the organization set, the voices are set, then we will call the, the PNC Council of Churches will bring us together, plus other, other stakeholders also. And we will start mobilizing our people, working together, making, ma making them aware that this uh, issue that is so detrimental to our environment and to our livelihood is not dead yet. Is still alive. And therefore, we have to come out very strongly, prepare ourselves, and move forward to for, uh, uh, that the government knows where we stand at this point, so that we can also be a voice that that to caution our government that our people are really the voice that they should listen to, and not the one that is coming from outside to destroy us. That's Thank what you. it is. Thank you very much, Cardinal. Moving on very quickly, Professor Chalapan, and then we'll end it with uh, Reverend Dr. Rame. Professor Chalapan. <clears throat> Sorry, could you, um, you want a short summary? Less than a minute. Hey? Eh? Yes, what's next for you and your ocean policy or the ocean policy? Um, Thank you. Um, just for Papua New Guinea to understand this is we have a work plan for the with the government. We're working with the the ocean, uh, the Department of Justice and Attorney's Office. There is an ocean secretary in there now, and so one of the important thing across here is they have a they have an action plan that they want to roll it out, and this is an important one. Going visiting provinces as well and including regional institutions, or regional organizations. Uh, um, groups in, 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 the, in Papua New Guinea. So the government is doing that. We are pushing it with this, with our own landowners. And so just to, like I told you, just to let you know, we've actually started mapping the ocean in places like CRC, Manus, New Island, from the land to the ocean as part of doing this governance issue about who owns that land, but it's sitting there. So basically <clears throat> the working with the Department of Justice and the science and technology research led by Professor Lohi Matanayo. We're all working together to see if we can visit as many provinces, LG and group as well, to tell them about the policy, the, the work that we're going to be instituting in the country. Um, and so we'll keep everybody up to make sure you come in for a consultation. But I think that's something new, not new, but that's an exciting area where we are dealing with this, knowing that the ocean is, one of our biggest resources. How do we manage it better? Thank you very much, Professor okay. Chalapan. We look forward to your consultation. Very quickly, Reverend Urame. Thank you. Uh, in uh, one experience, uh, when the uh, proposed Wapi Golfu Mine you know, uh, consultation took place, uh, we met and many government ministers were there and also the prime minister. And uh, we uh, went against the idea of, you know, uh, dumping the waste into the sea. And yet, uh, you know, uh, environmental permit was uh, given. So we ended up in frustration. And now with this issue, uh, with the uh, deep sea mining, a license has been already, you know, uh, uh, granted or given. And so uh, the, Papua New Council of Churches met and, and wrote a letter to the government to withdraw uh, the license. Up to now, uh, there is no response. The next uh, you know, uh, step would be uh, to uh, mobilize, as the Cardinal mentioned, the uh, heads of the churches together and, and approach the, the government again, uh, meaning if we can also even go to the prime minister's office and present our petition to withdraw the license, because uh, when the license is given, uh, this is already a start into something that is more destructive for our people in Papua New Guinea. We don't want to become a place where we will create you know, damage to the entire Pacific. That is our position, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Reverend Urame. That brings us uh, to the end of our question and answer session. I'll hand it back over to Francis. 
Thank you very much, uh, Joey. On behalf of the Pacific Blue Collective, I take this time to say and thank you so much to our speakers for sharing their stories and experiences with us all and everyone joining us and participating in this webinar from Fiji and around the region. Please do check out the Pacific Blue Line page on Facebook or our website and sign the petition. Join with us to defend and protect our Solowara. I would like to conclude our Talon North this afternoon with a short poem written by Wadley Berry Igivisa from Goroka, the Easter Highlands province of Papua New Guinea. He wrote this poem as part of his vision in the Reweaving the Ecological Met publication from the deep Pacific Voices for a New Story. It's titled The Language of Trees and Clams. When my father cuts down trees to plant yams, he speaks to them. He summons their spirits and they reason beside the mumu pit and harvest he gets enough for a meal. When my mother goes out to fish for clams, she sings a song. She sings softly, sweetly. Then she swims into the heart of the sea and brings back home just enough for a meal. We have an understanding, us and them. The land, the sea, and our fathers are one. We have farmed this land for a thousand sons, and we harvest not to herd, but to heal. But the spirits left when the machines came, and with them, the language of trees and clams. I hope that poem will remind us of our unique relationship with our environment, and more than ever, to protect and defend her. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you to the organizers, our speakers, our viewers. Thank you, Tomas Nisa Mwademanda.